Uh, so let's uh, get started with uh, this programming for this session, uh, Policy and Advocacy 101, Achieving the Province That We Want. Um, and uh, really happy for folks to be part of this session. It's always been an important part of the gathering uh, in order to, to do that work, to ensure that we're learning about uh, the basics and, and interactions of policy and advocacy. Uh, and I also see there's lots of folks on the call too, who maybe could be teaching this session instead of me and who've been teachers to me. So I'm grateful to for, for you for being here. And one of those people is, is Raisa, uh, my colleague who is joining me up here on the screen. Uh, Raisa is originally from New Brunswick and uh, she I met her when she was serving as the executive director for the New Brunswick Environmental Network. Uh, and Raisa, your organizing uh, capacity, your, your capacity as a network weaver was uh, really blew me away when we first met. And I'm so grateful now that we have a chance to, to work together because Raisa is our, our national government relations director uh, and is based out of Montreal. Uh, so Raisa, I'm gonna pass it off to you uh, and we'll uh, sort of be tag teaming this presentation today. Great. Thanks, Michael. So I think everyone, is everyone seeing the screen? Okay, good. Yeah. So yeah, thanks, Michael. And um, welcome everyone to this Policy and Advocacy 101 session. So Michael and I are going to be tag teaming this. Um, and so for the next hour or so, we're going to be sort of breaking it up a little bit between um, some presentations and some discussions. So I'm going to start us off. Um, talking about public, public policy, what it is, how does it work. Um, then we're going to break out into just some small groups so you guys can share some of your experiences with a discussion question. And then I'm going to hand it over to Michael, who's going to talk about why we should care about public policy and then key considerations if you're thinking of developing an advocacy plan or a campaign or something like that. Um, then we'll send you off again for uh, the second discussion question again, so you can uh, learn from each other's experiences. And then we'll come back and um, hopefully have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. So that's the plan. Um, so I'm going to dive right into it. Uh, so public policy, what is it? So basically, um, it's everything. It's, um, it's marriage, voting, the laws and rules and regulations about how our society works or, or doesn't work um, has to do with public policy. Um, and so there's a few things I want to just um, talk to you about, these different aspects of policy. Um, so the first is the government's agenda. So a government's agenda is the statement of their values and priorities, what they're going to act on, what they're going to uh, not act on. Um, it's usually um, framed around a, an election platform, um, would be the first sort of glimpse into what a government's agenda is going to be um, when they're elected. But then as, as, um, as time goes on, once they've been elected, some that agenda might change or shift based on, um, you know, uh, what the other parties are asking for, what the public is asking for, or external forces beyond their control, such as a pandemic. So the agenda really is sort of the overarching philosophical um, priorities of the government of the day. So then under within that, there's all these different things like laws, regulations, policy frameworks, programs, budgets. Um, so these are all different aspects of public policy. So I'm just going to talk about them, each of them. So a law is something that's passed by the legislature um, that says, you know, people have to do a certain thing or can't do another thing or, or it sort of sets out the, the legal, um, legal framework for, for whatever it is. So often um, in a law, the, it will delegate authority to either a minister or a cabinet, the cabinet or some other body to develop regulations under that law. So regulations are rules that specify how the ideas of the, that law are actually going to be implemented. So I'm going to give you an example. So the law might say um, that anyone driving a vehicle in Manitoba needs to have a license. And the regulations would then say, um, would then talk about how you would go about getting the license, what kind of test you need to take, um, maybe what fees you would need to pay to, to get your license, those kinds of things. So the law lays out the kind of overarching um, main ideas, and then the regulations are really the implementation. And so the law, again, the law is passed by the legislature, and then the regulations are usually delegated to some other, um, the minister or, or some other body. 
Um, so then there's policy frameworks. So policy frameworks are not anything that's enforceable like a law or a regulation, but it, um, it, it would outline sometimes sort of the, the overall goal of that, that, that particular set of laws or set of regulations. And sometimes it will bring in um, examples of things from other, other provinces or other jurisdictions and how their laws work and then how, how ours differ from that or are the same as that. So that's um, the policy framework just provides that overarching guidance to developing the laws and the policies and the programs, et cetera. So <clears throat> then there's programs. So programs are a bit sort of, I guess, different from laws and regulations in, the, in that they're, um, they're something that the government wants to do as part of its agenda. So for example, there might be a program about um, increasing employment. Um, among the population or reducing the level of unemployment. And so that program might include something like skills training programs um, for, for people in different communities. So, so that's, it's not really a law and it's not a regulation, but it is something that the government's doing. The government's either putting money towards it or putting um, um, you know, people power towards it to further their agenda, which in this case would include um, in, uh, increasing employment. Um, and then there's the budgets. So the all important budgets. Um, <clears throat> so the budgets are, are important because it shows us um, out of the government's agenda where their, where their priorities are in terms of where if there's a large budget item, if something is going to cost $100 million in the budget and then something else is going to cost only a million dollars in the budget, sometimes that can give a an idea of the relative importance that they're putting on that particular thing, although not always because sometimes things just cost more than others. Um, so those are the sort of the different, um, I guess, pieces of when we're talking about public policy and we're wanting to have influence over these different things, those are the different areas where we can have influence. So the next thing I wanna talk about is jurisdiction. Um, so there's different jurisdictions. So in Canada, we have the federal jurisdiction, which is the government of Canada. We have the provincial jurisdiction, which is you know the government of Manitoba or Quebec or New Brunswick or whatever. And then there's municipal jurisdiction, which is um, obviously city and town level. So, and, and those different levels are responsible for different things. And so that's an important thing when you're thinking about um, if you wanna, you know, make your voice heard about a program or a particular law, you ha have to know who's responsible for it. So the federal government is responsible for things like uh, international trade, um, our military and defense, our currency, so the Canadian dollar, banking, citizenship, so all those things that are broad across the, and applicable across the country. Pr the province is responsible for health care, um, as probably everyone knows, education. So our education systems are set up by province. Um, natural resources, both um, development of and protection of natural resources, that's a provincial um, jurisdiction. And then municipal jurisdictions, so the towns and cities, they're responsible for things like public transit, uh, water and, and sewage, those ki kinds of things that are really uh, city-based. So sometimes those jurisdictions can overlap. So for example, um, the f it, even though the, the city is responsible for transit, there might be federal funding that's going into supporting that transit, or there might be provincial funding that, or both going into supporting that transit. So it's really the municipality that's organizing the transit and responsible for it, but they're partnering with other levels of government to, um, to pay for it. And so, and that can happen on different issues or different in different areas that there might be kind of different levels um, that are responsible for it. And then there's sometimes there's um, things that maybe all the levels of government are interested in or have an agenda around. So for example, something like multiculturalism, you could certainly have a multiculturalism um, sort of a program from the city that was celebrating the multiculturalism within the within the city, but you might also have provincial level and federal level, um, either things like immigration programs or other sort of things that help um, either increase multiculturalism or, or help celebrate it. So anyway, that th there's all examples of jurisdiction, but the, but the point is that depending on what you're trying to do or wh where you're trying to um, make change, your, the jurisdiction is an important thing to, to consider. 
And then there's the application of public policy. So um, now again, we're talking about the laws, the regulations and all those things that some of them apply to different, different things. So they could have geographic application. So for example, something could apply um, within um, a floodplain, that would be a geographic boundary around this particular regulation. Um, something might be a sectoral application. So for example, um, if you're if you're an elementary school teacher and there's changes to the building co code, uh, that's probably not really going to affect you. But if you're in construction, then changes to the building code will affect you. So that's an example of a, a sector based um, application. But then again, if you're an elementary teacher and there's changes to the grade three science curriculum, that's an example of something um, that would affect you. And then the, and the application could be target populations. Um, so certain things could be targeted, say, at seniors or at um, a particular community or, or something like that. And then there's other ones that are applied generally. So the, the example I gave about the, um, the driver's license, obviously, that's across the whole population. So that's a um, quick snapshot of what public policy is and all the different things that it um, encompasses. And so now I'm going to talk just a little bit about how it works. So um, everyone, we all know that there's these different cycles um, in terms of public policy. So there's um, a four year election cycle. Uh, or sometimes it can be less if, if, the, if an election is called sooner, but generally speaking, it's four years. And so within that cycle, um, usually in the first year, if a government's just been elected, that first year is spent um, doing the low hanging fruit or the things that they had in their platform that are are really easy to implement so they can get some sort of quick wins out, out right out of the gate and and show that they're doing what they said they were going to do but they're also kind of getting getting themselves organized for their four years of of all the, all the programs and the and the um, laws and all that stuff that they're going to roll out over the four years and then years two and three are really spent doing the work implementing their agenda that they laid out and then the fourth year of their they're kind of um, preparing then for the next election cycle so developing their platforms and that kind of thing so so there's there's always different spots within that election cycle to um, that are the sweet spots um, for example if you're wanting a change that they promised in their election platform then that first year might be the might be the time to push for it because they're wanting those quick wins and if but if you're wanting a change that they didn't have in their platform um, that might take a little bit longer so you might want to work towards it in the second or third year of that election cycle um, there then there's the budget cycle so there's a budget every year um, the governments have a budget they they will often do pre-budget consultations um, with with the public um, that's usually or can be face-to-face um, -face sessions, although this year, of course, most of it is online um, or, or, or people can submit written submissions. So that's an opportunity to um, share what your priorities are for, um, for the next year's budget. Um, and then the budget is delivered once they, they kind of accumulate all of those consultations and then also weigh it against their own government agenda figure out what they want to focus on for the next year and then put those things into the budget. Um, and then an even shorter cycle is the legislative cycle. So um, the legislature usually sits um, starting sometime in the fall and ending sometime in like May or June. So it's probably a six to eight month uh, legislative cycle. And it usually starts with a speech from the throne which is um, a speech that's delivered by the lieutenant governor, but prepared by the government that talks about all of the things from their government agenda that they're going to deliver on in that, elect, uh, that legislative cycle. Um, and then, um, and so again, that's an opportunity to sort of listen to that speech from the throne, listen to see if your priorities are in there. If they are great, it's time to push. If they're not, then it's it's time to do more behind the scenes work to um, to make sure those those priorities are in the next speech from the throne. Um, and then while they're sitting in the legislature, they're introducing laws. So those are the new laws that they're they're wanting to bring in. 
um, laws go through a first reading and then there's then it goes to a second reading in the legislature and then after that it goes to a committee so committees are made up of of the of the um, members of the legislature and they're um, they're reviewing it they're consulting with experts they're wanting to make sure that this law really is um, does what it's supposed to be doing and then once the committee is done with it and they might make amendments to it then it comes back for a third reading and it's voted on. And if it passes, it gets royal assent, which means that it becomes law um, or it can die. Um, so sometimes you'll hear somebody saying something like it, it died on the on the offer paper. Um, so that what that means is in that legislative cycle of six to eight months, it went maybe it went through a first reading and a second reading and maybe it went to committee, but then they the legislature decided to take their break for the summer and it never made it onto the third reading and their vote so that means that it's done it's done for that for that legislative cycle and if they want to um if they still want to do it they're going to have to reintroduce it and start from the first reading again um, in the next legislative cycle so that's um that's a sort of quick and quick and uh and dirty version of, of public policy and how it works. So we're going to get you thinking a little bit here about um, a time that a government policy affected your life or your work, either negatively or positively. So this is just to get those, um, your, everyone thinking about all of the different ways that, um, that public policy affects our lives and our work. Um, so we're going to break you out into breakout rooms and um, give you about 10 minutes to talk about that question. And I'm going to stop my screen share. Great. Thanks, so, Risa. And I'll just add that I added the uh, questions here in the chat. So they'll stay with you when you go to your breakout room. And the first one is we really encourage you to introduce yourselves, talk about maybe the work that you're doing right now, or maybe what you'd like to be doing uh, when you before you answer the question too. So I have about 10 minutes for this. Just give me a moment here, folks. Sure, if anyone knows um, or has run a Zoom call before from the back end, breakout groups can be a bit of a complicated thing. Um, so thanks for that patience too while we're getting those in order. <clears throat> I'm not sure how much time we have, but Race, I'd be curious to know your quick answer to that question. Maybe the first time that you like thought about government policy well, in your life. Yeah, I was thinking about that today, and um, the the example I came up with was when so my my partner is from the states, and when he moved to Canada, we were we were moving all of his stuff to Canada, and we got to the border, and there was a regulation in place that we were not aware of that you cannot bring a vehicle into the country if you're moving without filling out certain forms and paying certain fees. And so we had no idea. So we had to, what we ended up having to do was leaving the vehicle at the border, going home with all the rest of the stuff in the U-Haul, and then had to go back to the border um, a few days later once they had processed <laughs> our application to move the vehicle from one country to the next. Wow. Wow, that is uh, frustrating. <laughs> yes. Okay, so folks, I'm sending you out now. Right. To, did send people go into breakouts? Yeah, I, I wasn't going to send you, but I accidentally sent some people in the absolute fury of clicking these things because I'm an idiot and didn't prep it before then. <laughs> uh, Tanya, I don't think.
Hey, everybody is just trickling back. Um, Darcy, maybe you can just let me know when everyone is back from their breakout rooms. <clears throat> sure, just a few more folks still having conversations. And I think we are all back. Awesome, that's great. Uh, we're really happy. One of the really most important things of the gathering is for a chance for people to connect. So uh, we hope, hope that that breakout room was useful even just for that. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit next about public policy. Why should we care? Um, and then I'll put the, the slideshow back up uh, to get back into a few other pieces. Um, but Raisa really outlined it in a, a really strong way that public policy is hugely impactful on our daily lives. Um, and that's policy at all levels of government, those budgets, laws, et cetera. And it's, it's kind of hard to stop when you begin to imagine um, the many ways that public policy can impact our lives. Before I dig into the next piece though about kind of advocacy and what we do about it, I want to acknowledge that it also can be a really hard thing to care about for folks. Um, and that policy in many ways is a product of the colonial system, uh, but it's also a blueprint or sort of articulation often for how colonization works. So sometimes that discussions of levels of government or how decisions are made or bureaucracy can be really challenging or even triggering for people. Um, and often public policy historically or currently is made to benefit some over others. Um, and in some cases, even still, public policy hasn't even acknowledged some folks as human uh, with the right to vote or, or things like that. Uh, it's also talked about that some people kind of feel the effects of public policy more or disproportionately, or its impact on the ground or in the streets. Like if you're somebody who's maybe been through the CFS system and EIA, you might uh, kind of be more involved with public policy and systems as opposed to others who have less interactions. And it's often sort of designed that way. Um, many folks who experience the brunt end of public policy are, are low income or communities who have been made more vulnerable precisely because of how policy is written. So I wanna highlight that yesterday, Nigan Sinclair in our opening plenary talked about the experience of indigenous peoples historically uh, through crisis relating to our theme. Uh, and one of the things he said is that's because Canada is seeking the last 1% of land um, that is no, not so-called crown land, um, which creates multiple ongoing crises in that sort of effort and the public policy changes that are needed uh, to support that mission of the last 1% of land. Rhonda Thompson, who was on the panel yesterday from Beyond Solidarity Statements talked about, we need to go beyond those solidarity statements and uh, that black indigenous or people of color need to be leading in terms of policy creation. Um, so it's really clear, I think, from those words that public policy can be detrimental to communities in many cases. Uh, and that should be a really important perspective for you, maybe if you're just sort of stepping into advocacy or public policy advocacy work. We're not starting from a neutral place. Um, but also at the same time, it's really important, I think, to care about public policy because of its potential to change those systems. So yesterday, Elder May Louise Campbell talked about how everyone participating in the gathering throughout this week is trying to do things better or believes that we can do things better and um, that really prioritizes the wellness of humanity and to change those systems. And she said that it turns out that those systems haven't been working too well for indigenous peoples and haven't been providing for the needs of people to make us whole. Um, so I think that we should care about public policy because it's an important avenue to change systems, to strengthen our communities and to create economies that benefit everyone. Last sort of piece about why I think uh, public policy, why we should care uh, is because many, so many of us here, and I think maybe everyone on this call and throughout the gathering has solutions that I think work better than those systems that have been in place um, or are already working on making them to be public policy. Um, so our work at SEDNET and within the network of, of people is focused on community economic development, which is an approach uh, and vision for building local economies that strengthen communities and benefit everyone. Um, so members of SEDNET have solutions for changing public policy to support our vision, which is uh, sustainable and inclusive communities directing their own social, economic, and environmental futures. Um, so it's a, an approach that's really complex and interconnected. So we have folks in the network working on things like ending and addressing poverty, building fair and local economies and what the government can do to support that, taking climate action or focusing on climate justice supporting inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, and how public policy can support those things, supporting community-led organizations or groups through things like the resources or funding that they need, 
or ensuring a democratic relationship between community and government. So I think we should care about public policy because all of these things are, are good solutions that we have. So we do that uh, best, I think, to push forward these solutions when we can do them um, collaboratively. So I'm just gonna go share my screen right now to jump back into our presentation. If you can just give me one moment. <clears throat> Let's play from here. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> As an organizer, you can see there's just too many uh, tabs open. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> um, oh man, okay, I'm just gonna leave it up there like that. That'll work just fine. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we change public policy uh, when we do things uh, collaboratively. Um, so the sort of phrase, there's strength in numbers has been something that's really been part of my life. Um, I stumbled into doing public policy work kind of accidentally. It was actually at this very event at the gathering back uh, in 2012, when I attended this session that uh, others were running. Um, and I think I had you know, kind of convictions and ideas about that there was injustice in the world, but this sort of session that told me I should care about public policy uh, and that contribute to collaborative efforts to do something about it was really a place where I sort of found my, my feet. Um, so the next little bit is what I'm gonna talk about is a really kind of high level way to think about uh, what we should do to change things, to, to achieve that vision. Uh, and you could spend your entire life and I think there's people who are working uh, who are on this call right now, who have been doing advocacy for so long, and I think there's sort of constant learning to do. Um, and that's maybe an approach that's really important as we step into this space, that there's sort of lifelong learning that can happen when it comes to advocacy. So uh, I'm not gonna uh, give, yeah, the full kind of presentation, because we can't do that, or full knowledge and the time that we have, but just sort of a smattering of ideas to think about if you're stepping into advocacy, um, and especially to do that collaboratively. So the first piece, talking about on your marks, is doing your research. Um, so really important to consider, race that was talking about those levels of government, what jurisdiction, that's a really essential question. Acknowledging that it can also be really frustrating that the colonial system means that governments can pass off certain things, but it's your advocacy won't be effective if you're asking your city councilor to raise the provincial minimum wage or asking the prime minister to install uh, some new equipment in the park down the street. So it's really important to think about the jurisdiction. Uh, what are the facts? What do you, people really need to know? Uh, and what is the research that maybe is not yet done? Uh, a really good place to start is considering what your opponent's arguments are, uh, or do they oppose the principle or approach? Um, uh, and how can you sort of begin to think about what the other side, so to speak, might be thinking so that you can strengthen your argument? One other important piece, piece is what we call political will, um, or sometimes what we call a policy window. Uh, is there a sort of a window that's open where there's a bit of support for an idea that you can really leverage uh, or try and get more support on? Um, or if there isn't any that you're seeing, can your advocacy work be focused on building that public will or political will or public support? Uh, as in, we want a politician to say themselves, well, if I don't support this thing that all these people in the community are supporting, people maybe won't like me or I maybe won't be reelected. Uh, so that's something to think about when you're doing your research to begin kind of if there's an issue you really, you really care about. What I'd also add really importantly, kind of repeating what I said before is that who's who's list I think can also be, are there people that are already working on this? Are there coalitions or groups out there in our city, in our province, across the country, internationally that are doing this work um, that you can plug into, get involved with, that you can offer your support or help to? Uh, and that's sometimes a better approach than going it alone. Um, in fact, I really suggest that it's a better approach because we are, I think, more effective when we do it together. The next piece, get set, uh, is ideas around kind of moving your, your campaign forward. Knowing what you want and being specific about the change that you want government to make will go a long way. Uh, you know, if you really want big uh, systemic change, say that, but also really lay out how the how kind of policy might change to support that big and, and visionary change that you have that will make it more digestible for, for government. There's a few other tips and, and ideas in there in terms of preparing your ask, your medium and your message. But what I'd really say is that 
kind of communicating your message in multiple different ways and to multiple different audiences or different learning styles can be really important. Tell a story, use numbers to uh, access the media and the role of media to tell personal stories uh, can go a really long way uh, to convincing people, but also having those numbers or, or backup research can be really crucial too. And then the last thing, go implement your action plan. So especially if you're doing this in collaboration with folks in the community who are working on policy advocacy, um, that will be really helpful to you in terms of accessing resources. If you're all volunteers, it's also really good to check in what kind of capacity you have, what talents does the group have, and also what energy do you have to do what it takes. Uh, and it's really important maybe to be honest too with your community if you can't take something on or with your limitations in some of this work, because it can be very challenging. Uh, it's also uh, great to think about leadership. Uh, it's really good and we, we advocate for horizontal leadership, which is a way that's more focused on collaboration as opposed to a top-down leadership style, but also consider that leaders are really important to, to forward ideas, to hold things together, or even to take the minutes or set the agenda for your meeting. Uh, the biggest things in terms of implementing your action plan is to consider that there's so much collaborative work going on in Winnipeg or Manitoba right now on a huge variety of important issues. Uh, and at the end, after breakout groups, I'm gonna put up two slides with six action items for coalitions or campaigns that are doing work right now. Uh, and I'm gonna encourage you right after this session to take action on at least one of those things. Uh, and maybe that action will be, it's an issue that you wanna get involved with and you'll reach out uh, to support that coalition or, or group that's organizing on an issue. Uh, so before we do that, uh, that's just, as I said, a really quick kind of uh, taste of what sort of things might go into advocating for the public policy issues that you want to work on. Um, we want you to consider this next question in the same groups, um, which is to think about a time that you've been involved with an advocacy campaign. And it could be as anything from that time when you maybe signed a petition or you went to your first protest or rally or event at the legislature or in the streets of Winnipeg or, or elsewhere in Manitoba. Or it could be something that you were maybe much more involved with or taking a kind of leadership role, so to speak, in terms of a call to action. We're not gonna have too much time on this, only about eight minutes. Um, so keep it really high level, but maybe think about that something that really sticks out for you, either your first time getting involved in some of this, what worked in terms of kind of hooking you in and, and what didn't, what messages really resonated. Uh, and let's stick to those questions, which I think Grace is going to pop into the chat um, when we kind of think about digesting some of this, how we move, how we do advocacy uh, work in our communities. And then we'll come back and I'll share those ways that you can take action right now. cover of night the moon is in the shadow of the bright of the day and a million and seven stars wait for to shine i'm gonna take my time and i'm gonna take my time the day just fine but I'm gonna keep it in mind that I should take my time the river can hear it unfold the forest is watching while everything grows and the field is for those not afraid to be free i'm gonna take my time and i'm gonna take my time
fire reminds me to move on today the wind keeps me company whenever she may and the rain will wash away footprints we've made i'm gonna take my time Take my time. The days are numbered, and that's just fine. I'm gonna keep it in my mind that I should take my. Um, one one half of my family is from Germany. And so I grew up hearing a lot of living in, in Russian-occupied Germany. And... Uh, yeah, this, this song isn't about, it's not either of their stories, but it's just, I think, some of what happened when I um, think about the effects of war on people and communities, both both the folks who are in a, in a conflict zone, but also people who um, have to don't been through such and uh, it's called soldier song another day goes by and I find that you are a stranger to me You talk without a reason And you think without a pause And you speak with all your fingers Sharing little bits of wisdom That see you through the day And I try and try to So another day goes by and I find that you are a stranger to me. You send another letter from the bowels of the brigade and you ask my favorite color, say that hell is frozen over and you need a little cheer. Cause your dying day is drawing near One more word before the war Remember me so Bye. 
was stranger to me Your medal's getting dusty In a shoebox, let it lie And your uniform has faded It's been years since you wore it And much to my dismay You still cry at night Don't make me stay I've got one last one for you today. And um, I know that I think it's Carrie Latimer, Latimer who's joining tomorrow, who's um, just such an amazing songwriter and, and human. She's one of my Winnipeg favorites. So you've got a real treat coming at you tomorrow. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks again for having me. And this one is called 13 Crows. And it is about my childhood. <laughs> tried to remember how it felt to be five and a half at the edge of a sandbox shipwrecks castles and warlocks secretly hoping for chicken pox so you could stay home from school wouldn't that be cool you wouldn't have to get them when you're older about all that stuff that he shouldn't have bought like that shitty wind-up radio nothing like the one he made in 42 with his dad a first world war veteran or that sinister cat why did i buy that i was right she didn't make me happy there came a time when he saw his life as he grew older his pictures laid out in the dust Put them all together one stitch at a time A little out of line Say, do you remember that day? There were 13 crows on our apple tree I said, tell me what you think about that He's so old he looked around Imagining his world is upside down All the books falling onto the ceiling or a huge step over the door frame Or a daughter who'd never say his name A son who wouldn't call winter walking at the mall Well, lucky that's not how it happened There came a time when he saw his life as he grew older His pictures laid out in the dust Put them all together one stitch at a time A little out of line saying there were 13 crows on our apple tree I said, tell me what you think about that He's so old, he took my hand saying, honey, I'll have you understand There's only two ways in this world to be You gotta be kind and you gotta be free I didn't always do that to take it from me and I have no complaints I'll take them up with the saints If in the end they let me into heaven There came a time when he saw his life as he grew older His pictures laid out in the dust Put them all together one stitch at a time A little out of line saying Do you remember that day? There were 13 crows on our apple tree I said, tell me what you think about that And he's so old Came a time when he 
So is life as you older His pictures laid out in the dust Put them all together once to at a time A little out of line saying Do you remember that day There were 13 crows on our apple tree He said, tell me what you think about that Thirteen crows on our apple tree I said, tell me what you think about that Tell me what you think about that <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Back Maddie. Thank you, Darcy. <laughs> Thank you so much.